And of course, we have Ajahn Brown from a sunny afternoon in Perth. So we'll just give it another half a minute or so. <clears throat> See if we can get a full house. And I think today we'll do something similar to yesterday. So there'll be a talk for about 40, 45 minutes, a five minute break and some guided meditation again. having a look at people's faces. <laughs> you all look reasonably well, hope that's the case. So uh, please Ajahn, when you're ready, I think we can start the Dhamma talk for this morning. Okay, very good. So hello everybody, again another day of retreat. And I hope you've been enjoying uh, the retreat so far. And uh, for today's little talk, about 40 minutes, just one of the, the teachings of Ajahn Chah, or the ways of expressing meditation, just came to mind a couple of minutes before uh, we started. And that is regarding the way of meditation and the entry into a nice, peaceful, aware, kind state of mind as our, our real home. The idea that many times people in our modern world don't have a home. They may have a house, they may have a flat, an apartment, sharing with others, or just their own room in a shared house. But to have a real home is something which is quite rare in our modern world. And a home should be a place where you feel safe, where you can relax, and where you can just be. In olden days, the home would be you know, where you went after going to work, or after plowing the fields, whatever you were doing in your life. And you go home to really rest and relax and just to regenerate all of your energies. But too many times now that even the house in which we live can be full of conflict, can be <coughs> um, not that restful. And of course, these days, people take their work back into their house. And so even there, it's not a real home in the sense of place where you can truly just let go of the world, relax, re-energize, so that later on you can serve other people. And that also just uh, brings in the, the idea, which we often discuss in monastic life, of the balance between leaving your real home and serving others and staying inside your real home to rest, energize, so you can go back to work afterwards. So that real home, what actually is it? And it has to be a place where you do feel that you, you don't have to protect anything, that you're not going to be criticized, you're not going to be blamed, you don't feel ashamed of anything, you don't feel anxious. It's a place where you feel totally safe. And such real homes are very hard to find in our world. And even for myself, even though I live with a lot of really um, high-minded monks and very good people, people I can trust, even there, that is not really my real home. And even in my office here, that's not my real home. But I'm very fortunate to have a cave. It's only a small cave, and maybe three meters in diameter, like a, like a, a half dome. And that cave over those years has become 
my real home. Because in there, I never, ever take any work. I'm not sure if actually you can get any signal on a computer there, but I've never even tried to get a signal in there. I've never taken books or even uh, pens to write anything in that cave. Because that cave is the place, just my real home, where I can just sit and relax and just be. I don't need to try and attain anything, to prove anything, to get anywhere or to get rid of things. Just a, t a place of real rest, a real home. And that to me was like the symbol of even uh, our meditation. And when you do close your eyes, you do sit down or lay down or however you're meditating, it is like you're leaving the world outside, the world of work, of, you know, sometimes with your body getting old, getting sick, and you know, wearing out, which happens with your body as you get old, and all the other problems and duties which you have in your life called responsibilities. And we all have those responsibilities, even if we are you know, so-called left the world. We left the world, I leave the world when I go into my meditation, but when I'm outside, I just work as much as I can to be of service to others. And without that real home, it would be very difficult to work to a very high standard. Because no matter what you do in this world, you'd always get some people misunderstand you and criticize you. And sometimes you don't have a place to go to afterwards. You're lost in a world where there's just so many like praying animals, if you want to use another word, uh, of people who, you know, they have their own agendas, their own things they want to do. And they just try and bite you or attack you and sometimes you try to do your best but you're limited to what you can do and so out there in the world it's so imperfect it's so difficult it's called dukkha suffering <laughs> and i always say a very brief description of the truth of suffering in the buddha's teachings is suffering is asking from the world something it can never give you and we and when we don't get what we think we deserve, very often we get upset, we get ashamed, we get angry, and we feel that the world is not fair. And of course, it is never fair. But if you have a real home, you can go into a place inside where <coughs> there should be absolute safety. No one can harm you. No one can criticize you or attack you. You're perfectly at peace. And the safety which occurs in meditation can sometimes be amazing. It's not just the emotional safety, even the physical safety. Okay, here's a nice little, oh, here's two stories about what happens when you get into deep meditation. And the first story I said only in passing and to answer to one of the questions was there's this gentleman, I don't mind saying his first name, Greg, and this was many, many years ago, 20, 25 years ago, probably now in Australia. And he was a gentleman who would only usually meditate for half an hour, 40 minutes. But then one afternoon, on a Sunday afternoon at home, there was nothing on the TV. <laughs> so he just went into his bedroom and sat down to meditate. And after an hour, an hour and a half, he hadn't come out of the bedroom. So his wife went in there to check on him and saw him sitting perfectly still, which you think would be a wonderful joy for someone seeing someone meditating so well. But the problem was the wife couldn't even see his chest go up and down. It appeared that he wasn't breathing. So you know what he did? She did? She called the ambulance. Over here in Australia, it's not 999, it's 000. And in five minutes of Sunday afternoon, there was no real business in the um, for the ambulances. So an ambulance roared up with a siren screaming, do, 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 do. and that's not really what an ambulance sounds like, but that's the best I can do without the access to special effects. And so the ambulance men went into the bedroom, they checked him, and they, could, they too couldn't see his breathing. And so they put him straight into the gurney, straight in the back of the ambulance, and together with his wife, they sped to the hospital, da, 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 going through all the red lights. And when they got to the hospital, the triage nurse took one look at him and 
this was an emergency, so I went to see the doctor. And the doctor was an Indian man. That you know, was so important. The doctor on duty that afternoon, on a Sunday afternoon, was Indian. And I say that because the doctor knew. He'd heard from his parents that sometimes people get into beautiful states of meditation where their body seems to stop. But the doctor had the accessories, which you don't see in monasteries, of ECGs and EEGs, but both were flat lines. And according to what his wife said, who was there just worried, sick about what her husband was up to, she thought he had died. And so that uh, the doctor put on the defibrillators. I know some doctors say these days they don't use defibrillators, they use injections of, what is it? Uh, anyway, to try and get the, uh, the body started again. But nothing worked. And the important thing was the doctor noticed something strange. First of all, it had started when this person was meditating. And number two, that this body was warm. And that was the most important thing. Your body is warm. That's even said in the suttas. It's a sign that you haven't died. You just into a very deep state of meditation. And so they kept on putting on the defibrillators. And then after a while, it wasn't due to the defibrillators. He told me that he decided it's time to come out of the meditation. And he came out. And as soon as he came out, beep, 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 the defibrillator, the, um, ECG and the EEG were working perfectly. And he just uh, bent up and said, what am I doing in here? I was in my bedroom. What am I doing in hospital? And the doctor gave him a thorough checkup. He was perfectly healthy. And they let him go home. He walked home. He said it was one of the most pleasant experiences of his life. For him it was, but his wife just really scolded him. He got a real sh shouting out on the way back home because his wife said, never ever do that again, <laughs> darling. I was always sick. The point was that even those, <coughs> excuse me, those electric shocks he could not feel. Even the sound of the ambulance he could not hear. And the feeling of the medics just picking him up and putting him in a gurney and, and the stretcher in the back of the ambulance, he couldn't know any of that only when he came out afterwards. And he was perfectly okay. Because the truth of the matter is that when you get into deep meditation, something goes on in your body, you're very, very safe. Incredibly safe. And these are the experiences which I have um, amassed over so, so, so many years. And even people who do manage to get into some nice deep meditations that some of the sicknesses which they have pass away. I mean, real sicknesses, deep sicknesses. And when those things happen, those type of things happen, it just gives you a lot of confidence that this is perfectly beautiful states we don't have to worry about. And this is actually something that they're your real home. The deeper you go inside your real home, the longer you stay in it, the more you can re-energize, uh, heal, and your emotions get stronger. I didn't mention a few days ago, a couple of days ago, that it does seem in my anecdotal experience over teaching so many years, that you know, females somehow have a better opportunity to get into these deep meditations, more of the manager. And I do that just anecdotally. I often wondered why. And one of the reasons is that the path into meditation it's not an intellectual journey. It's an emotional journey. If you get to know your emotions, the negative emotions and the positive emotions, and you get to understand them, how they work. And especially in just some of the emotions like wanting, feeling you need, need something more, and obviously the fear. So much of the fear emotion is like projecting onto the future something which may happen in your theories, but doesn't ever happen. It's just looking at the future with a negative mind. Oh my goodness, what if this happens? Which is something bad or something wrong. And all the years which I've been teaching meditation and practicing meditation, the only ever thing I've seen from meditation is good things happening. The person grows, develops, 
becomes wise, becomes kinder. And all these things which you see happen over a long time, your emotions get wiser. It's not that your emotions disappear altogether when you develop meditation. It's if the negative emotions are the ones which get less and less and less and eventually disappear. And the positive emotions get stronger and stronger and stronger. I know that just beforehand, Ajahn uh, Venerable uh, uh, Chanda, she was asking me about you know, practicing loving kindness and the four Brahmiharas as a way to deep meditation. And of course you can do that. But for myself, that sometimes whenever you practice these things, they can get really, really strong. And I remember just the time when we used to do a, a chant in this monastery over here in Perth as a spreading loving kindness in all the directions chant. And I recall that giving up chanting that, and I just couldn't do it any longer. And the reason was, is because as I was chanting, I was very mindful. So I was aware of the words and their meaning as I was doing this chant. And the words were just so powerful, so beautiful. But as I was chanting them, my mind was actually generating the meta, the loving kindness. It was generating it and spreading it. And my mind was getting, <laughs> the only word I can say is so blissed out. That, you know, you just had to shut your eyes to <coughs> enjoy the bliss even more. And beautiful nimitas came up and, you know, you were away. And you couldn't really do any more chanting. So it was the bliss of those, the meaning of that chant. It generated an emotion which was just so, so delightful. And that sort of took over and took you into very deep meditations. And just to make it more technical for anybody who wants to understand how these things work, the emotion was the most important thing. The beauty, the bliss, the peace, of like loving kindness for the whole, it wasn't actually for the whole universe. You did it for the whole universe, first of all, including yourself. And then it became loving kindness, which was without an object, I sometimes call disembodied loving kindness. There's a feeling of it rather than directing it anywhere. It was just all over the place, spreading everywhere without any place it didn't exist. It was universal at the same time as I mentioned yesterday. When things get infinite, they also get like into one point. There's no difference between them. They're sort of almost equivalents of zero and infinity. And that's a maths idea. And little by little, this got so strong. But usually for those people, this is the anecdote again. It's not said in the text, but usually if you have loving kindness and limit of loving kindness, it's usually a beautiful gold light. I don't know why it's gold, but it's this very delightful color, which usually happens with the loving kindness generated nimittas. And of course, from there, you just, the nimitta is so strong and so powerful, it just takes you into the jhanas. But anyway, the point of that little uh, anecdote was to say just how it is getting to know those emotions and getting to trust them. Because most people in this world that we've been taught to analyze and have an intellectual idea of everything. We know sort of the things names, we don't know how we feel and how those emotions affect us and how to develop the positive ones and let go of the negative ones. And this is something which is important. We do almost as a little trick in our meditation, starting off with just relaxing our body and feeling the emotional delight. It's a mind made object, the delight of a relaxed body. You're kind to it. It doesn't make any sense as a scientist, especially as a, as a doctor, when I say, oh, just imagine taking your brain out of your skull and putting it outside to give it a rest. And that's a ridiculous idea. But nevertheless, it works. Those imaginations, with the emotional positive energy, you're doing this for a purpose, trying to get your overworked brain to have a bit of a break, have a rest, send it on a holiday. Let it take a rest because we do overwork so much and taking 
a part of your body which is injured or hurting, focusing on it, getting to know it and trust it and feel safe about it. And when you feel safe about something, you've got no barriers anymore. There's no walls between you, know, you and the sort of the, what you're focusing on. And when you take down those barriers, you can really blast loving kindness you know, into a part of the body. I don't blast, that's a pretty male term. You can soak and drench the loving kindness into that part of the body. And you feel it because it's you know, not defended, not covered up. All that loving kindness can reach all the parts of that part of your body, which just need a bit of help and relaxation. And just the way you look at an injured, painful part of the body changes. And it's just wonderful to experience just what this powerfully trained body, which has learned how to meditate and learn how to generate good emotions, how powerful that can be. So the meditation becomes your real home. Inside, and sometimes when you really need a rest, you've been working so hard, doing so many jobs, so many stuff, which is important to do, but quite frankly, we do too much of that, most of us. And sometimes, because we don't know any other place to hang out. You hang out with others, hang out with your internet, hang out with, I don't know, doing this and doing that. It's nice to hang out inside, to go inside where your real home truly is. And if you hang out inside where your true home really is, it's like, you know, even your body vanishes and all your past and future vanishes. You know, I still have great arguments, no, no positive arguments, more like discussions, but with passion, you know, with compassion, <laughs> but like passion, because I, I, this really fires me up when I can see just what we can do to make a better world, a, a better psychology for human beings. One of those things which you, know, you find when you have a real home, you can go inside, you can keep all that old baggage of the past and the future outside your house. It doesn't need to come in. <coughs> Which means you put all those baggages outside. You know, in Buddhist temple, you never take your shoes inside the temple. You always leave them outside. The same in your real home. When you go to deep meditation, you never take your past and future and all that stuff which you've had to deal with in your life. You never take that inside. Leave it outside. And just even this afternoon, or my afternoon, a couple of hours ago, just I'd lent a little book, a little comic book on Buddhism uh, to a young, young girl, and she handed it back after two years of keeping it. She hadn't seen me, but she gave it back. And it was on the story of Angulimala. Angulimala, this robber, this murderer, serial killer. And you can have all sorts of explanations why he did that, but just to have killed so many people, just imagine what that would do to your mind and all the heavy baggage that would, that would entail. And the Buddha taught him and he became an arahat, fully, fully enlightened, really quickly. And that's, you know, for psychologists, that's almost like impossible. You know, all that sort of psychological trauma and seeing people pleading for their lives and the, the pain and the trauma of that would be something which was, how can you ever let go of that? But then Gurdjimala did. We've got one of my other great heroes, Patachara. And when I read her story, the first time I found out about Patachara, the great Arahat Bhikkhuni, He's supposed to be one of the greatest teachers in the time of the Buddha. It was when I was reading the, the verses of the enlightened elders, monks and nuns. And that ordaining bhikkhunis is nothing new. <laughs> the Buddha had arahat bhikkhunis in his time, and they were amazing. But anyway, this bhikkhuni, Patachara, that you know, she, she lost, lost her... Uh, two children, husband and parents on the same day. And poor Patacha, she was a lay person, not just a wife at the time. And she had that trauma of losing everybody in her family. P 
parents, husband and two children on the very, very same day. And that just totally made her distraught and basically crazy. And she was wandering around, just not knowing who she was, where she was, what she was doing. Just mad. And she just happened in her wanderings to sort of wander into the Jata Grove Monastery where the Buddha was, was staying and giving a talk. And because of her craziness, she was absolutely naked. No clothes on her at all, and a young woman. And many people said, no, get out of here, you can't come in here, you know, you're improperly dressed. And sometimes, you know, people, they say that when somebody comes into a monastery, even today, and they're not properly dressed, I say, well, it depends why they're coming in here. They come in, we can get them something to wear later on if necessary. But as they're coming in, be kind. And that's the Buddha's example, so kind to Patachara. She said, oh, come in. And one of the monks took one of his extra robes and wrapped it around her. You know, and the Buddha taught her, and she became this incredible, powerful, wise, enlightened being. And of course, the reason why uh, so the reason why I said that I first came across her by reading in the Bhikkhuni Terry Gata was because he read all these nuns one after the other. They said the meditation was getting nowhere. And for years sometimes getting nowhere. And then they came across this incredible teacher who taught them how to really meditate. And they became enlightened within days. And that was Patachara. Brilliant, brilliant teacher. But because of just the depth of her suffering and the power of how to let that all go, she could actually find, she found her real home. She had no choice. Outside was just suffering. But inside was peace, freedom. And she showed that real home to so many others. So that real home as you go inside, imagine what a home is. Just even just don't even give it names, but feel it. Just feel what is a place of safety, of peace, of love, of freedom. The other day when I did that guided meditation of imagining you're the Buddha and under the Bodhi tree, just perfectly enlightened, it was using a similar idea. How would it feel if you're fully free of all wanting, of all ill will, of all negativity, everything was perfect, everything had been done in your life, nothing left to do, perfectly free. And because I kept talking about that for 15, 20 minutes, then eventually that we start to feel those things. It is the words, the concept lead to the emotions. And the emotions are much more real than the, the words. And it's the emotion of peace, of freedom, of safety. Maybe I missed out the safety part of it, but you feel that safety. In your meditation and sit there, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world outside. And oh, I think I can be honest about this. Even at the time, I mentioned, I think this to Venal Chanda before and to other nuns, at the time when I performed that bhikkhuni ordination 11, 12 years ago, uh, over here and really got uh, threatened by some very, very senior monks over in Thailand. And it could, it, every now and again, I remember thinking this can be really serious. You know, you could be just you know, sent away somewhere with no support and no one respecting you. But then, even though all that was happening on the outside, I do remember having my real home. The real home was not in a monastery. The real home was not even as a monk. Because the monk is outside there. It's inside. You know, the real monk is inside. Someone who's free, who's peaceful, who has this beautiful kindness. So whenever life got tough, it wasn't, what was the old saying? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. That doesn't work. When the going gets tough, the tough go into meditation. They don't get going anywhere. They stay still and stay where they are, where they are. So you tend to just go inside, inside your body, 
inside your mind. Inside, onto the breath, it's just a way ahead, the doorway into the, the deep meditations, the breath and the limiters, and even just the limiters, that's a nice real home. So places where you can have a great resort, a place of freedom and rest and joy, where no one and nothing can harm you at all. A place where you can rejuvenate, and not just rejuvenate, just strengthen. And I don't mean just strengthening your body, I mean strengthening your mind, your emotional skills, and even sort of your insights. Sometimes over my life as a monk, I've invented so many similes, and some of them have been you know, quite good similes. And other people have said, oh, you know, we love those similes. Ways of explaining, and even adapted other similes. You've already heard a few of them, like the monster in the emperor's palace. Yeah, that's in the suttas, but it's not explained the way I explain it. And use that as a wonderful way of understanding just how to deal with negativity. Or the, you know, from my father's tale of the door of my heart open, no matter what you're experiencing. And really emphasizing that the two bad bricks in a wall and don't just focus on the two negative parts of the wall, otherwise you want to destroy it like I wanted to destroy the first wall I built. But seeing it in context, seeing the good bricks in the wall, seeing the, you know, just when I was a school teacher and having to set an examination for maths and realizing that the best toughness of the exam was to make it so the average score was 70%. And realizing from that, that's life. If life you always got 100%, you wouldn't be growing at all. Life would be too easy. If life was you know, 5%, 10%, and 90% wrong, you get depressed. But to set the exam score, the average score at 70% means, yeah, you can do life. And where you make mistakes is where you grow. You're seeing the value of mistakes. And that's where we grow, we learn, we can expect to make mistakes. And that becomes a beautiful part of our life. And all those ideas, ways of teaching, which have been very helpful to many people, all come when you go in your real home. You really relax to the max. And when you come out afterwards, the mind is bright and it can see things in new ways. You know, often you give talks to um, industry groups, you know, to, I've given talks in so many weird groups, you know, weird, weird groups, you know, like HR conferences, a computer, world computer conference, the keynote address, and so many other sort of weird places. And often when I get an invitation, if it's really weird, a place I've never been before, a place where you don't really think you belong, you know, I sign up for that just because it's interesting, it's fun, a bit rebellious. But in those places, when you give those talks, you, where does that idea's wisdom come from? And sometimes it's going into your real home, going inside, relaxing, resting. You come out afterwards, and ideas just come. Innovations come. New ways of looking, they just come. And they're usually so helpful. And one story <coughs> that one of the disciples many, many, many years ago, unfortunately, she passed away. Now, she had a really bad, I wouldn't call it a really bad job. Someone has to do it, but a very difficult job. She was working in the like social services department, you know, the child support services. And she had rose through the ranks She's a brilliant woman. And her job, her job was to be the one who made the final decision if a child should be taken away from his mother. Because the mother was like a, an, a drug addict or had um, psychological problems. And just the child would be worse off with the mother than being put in some sort of home or foster to somebody else. And that was just an emotionally just so draining and always really, really complicated. 
You know, this is a child's existence, her future was at stake. And I remember her coming to one of my retreats and she came very late at night. She didn't come for the evening talks. When she came late, the morning morning, she checked in and she said she was just finishing off. She never actually finished it off. They're trying up as many loose ends as possible because the work still always came in. But she was a good meditator, so she did let go. She put all that aside and had a sense of a real home inside the meditation retreat center. So you can put all those worries and concerns aside and just go inside and get some nice meditations. I remember her coming in the middle of the retreat, coming with a big smile on her face to, uh, for an interview. She said, amazing. I've had, I haven't really thought about work for three or four days. I rested, just re-energized myself. And then just outside of the meditation, I held all these amazing ideas about how to solve some of the worst problems in my job. And I said, they were just, wow, where did that idea come from? And she wrote them down and then she said, well, I'm going to put them away now. I'm not going to do anything. I've still got a couple of days of retreat left. But then afterwards, when she went back to work, she implemented those ideas, which were really innovative. She said it was amazing how well they worked. It's as if going to a real home, not just is you know, just for the bliss of it, it's what happens afterwards. It's not just for the, the insight of knowing the nature of anicca and anatta, it's also for the nature of your emotions and how they work and how you can see much further than a mind which is uh, tired or obsessed with thought or just limited by what it's been taught. It's one of the sayings, another saying which I made up is never allow your learning to stand in the way of truth. I and mean, even really good learning. You may just have memorized Ajahn Brahm's teachings in full. Please, for goodness sake, put them aside when you see the truth. In other words, the learning and the truth, you can see their connection, but the truth, the emotional reality, that is something different and much more powerful. That's one of the reasons why the, after a while, the emotional skills, which come from staying in your real home, really come to the fore. And again, just all those things about keeping all those stuff from the past. There's a personal story. Uh, my father, and I've, got a, I've only got a limited world experience, being a monk for 46 years. But my father, he was born in Liverpool, and he would never, ever say anything about his father, my paternal grandfather. And that was concerning for me. And when I got to you know, 15 or 16, I really confronted my own father. Why didn't you talk about your dad? I want to know about my grandfather. Who was he? How was he? What did he do? And my father was brave enough to actually to say how he felt about his own father. And please excuse the language here, because I'm just repeating what my father said about his father. He said, your grandfather was a bastard. And that really shocked me because I never heard my father say such language. And I said, what do you mean? And then he explained the domestic violence which he had experienced and which he had seen inflicted on his mother, who he loved dearly. My paternal grandfather was a plumber. And if he did get any money, it was mostly spent in the pub coming back late at night. And he would take off his belt, his leather belt. And he'd whip any kid who was in the way for no reason at all. And often that was my father. And sometimes he would beat his wife. My, mother, my father could see that. See his drunken dad just laying into the one person he cared for. And the result of that was, you know, he thought my grandfather was a bastard, but he said he made a resolution at the time. He said, if ever I survive this, if I ever get through this, if ever I have children, 
which was now almost an impossibility, thought, but if ever I do, I will never ever hit them. I will never treat them like that. And he was a victim of domestic abuse, of like child abuse. But he said afterwards that he can't do that to anybody else. He had a different response than most psychologists say is possible. He could never hit us, my brother and I, he just couldn't do it. <laughs> because that feeling inside of him, he'd learned something. He knew how it felt and he wasn't ever going to do the same again. It was as if the trauma of the past had developed an, an emotional understanding, which meant he could never do that same, he had to do it a different way. And that was just the possibilities which you've seen, how people can transform and Gudi Maras and Patacharas, how that sometimes going to your home, taking a bit of time out from life, getting into some nice meditations, it strengthens the wise emotions inside of you and it limits the negative emotions. And those wise emotions means you start to certainly to value, you know, there's good things inside of you which create a much more beneficial, wonderful world. And the negative emotions, those negative emotions, I usually call them like weeds in the garden. The weeds in the garden you don't pull out, you just water the flowers instead. Put all the attention on the flowers and those weeds tend to disappear. They get throttled, overgrown by the flowers because they're the ones which you water, which you focus on. So it's simple teachings, but they really work. Those were the teachings I used to give in prisons. Wonderful teachings. Just like uh, that time, I'm just wandering here and there a bit, but one of the most wonderful experiences of my life, my, one of my most emotionally enriching tales was the time I got a telephone call from a prison officer. And this prison officer sort of wanted to speak to me and said, Ajahn Bro, can you please come back to teach in our prison? He said, I'm just, I really am busy these days. I've got so many other things to do. I'll send another monk. That's what I said. We didn't have any nuns at that time. I'll send another monk. And he said, no, I want you. And that's when I said, why me? That's the usual question, why me? And then he gave me this piece of praise, which I accepted. And I said, oh, no, 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 don't say it. that's That's ordinary. It was a beautiful piece of praise. And he said that I've been in this prison service all my life, it's my career, and I'm about to retire next year. And I've seen something very strange happen, very unique, which I haven't seen anywhere else. That every prisoner who came to your class, when they're released, they never ever come back to jail. I don't know what you've been doing, but it's working. That's why we want you back. Zero recidivism. And that really sort of beautiful emotion inside of me when I received that praise. But of course, I also asked, why? Why? What have I done or didn't do, which had an, such a wonderful, beautiful effect on his prisoners? And then I found out that when I went to jail, I never saw any prisoners. I saw, okay, you may have heard this before. Human beings who've done crimes, but no criminals. You saw rapists. Oh, sorry, I didn't see rapists. I saw a person who'd done rapes. I'd seen a person who'd stolen, but I never saw a thief. I saw people who'd done some terrible crimes, but they weren't criminals. You saw something more than that terrible hurtful act which put them inside jail. When I saw that, I watered that. I was watering the flowers, not the weeds. And they saw that as well. They realized that they weren't a murderer. They were a person who'd murdered. It was totally different. They grew and they left jail. They became wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. Still, they had the, the karma from the past, which they don't get rid of. 
But nevertheless, although they, they'd lessen it, eventually get rid of it. But what's important was they'd focus so much on the positive inside of them. They became really beautiful human beings. Those are like emotional insights. This is not because the last couple of days I thought I was getting far too much into jhanas and enlightenment and all that sort of stuff, which is important. These other things are also very, very powerful. And those are the ones which inspire people. There's, ooh, there's a lot into this going to your real home. So don't be afraid of your real home. Too many people are homeless in the wrong sense of the word. Haven't got a refuge in life. A place where they can go to when everything outside of them is trying to destroy them, like after the Bikuni ordination, which I was front and center of. And then you can go into your real home and you feel so safe, so peaceful, so rested. You come out afterwards, willing to fight the world and, and ordain more Bikunis. Hello. Oops. I've been lost. No, you're still. I'm still there. You are, yes. Okay, I can't see anybody. Oh. Okay. Anyway. Okay, very good. You can hear me. So that's enough for now. So anyway, that was the well, 45 minutes already. So there must have been. I don't know how that worked, but anyway, <laughs> how can I get back on my screen? I might have to sort of click out and go back on again. Is that okay? Okay, I'm going to click off and come back on again. And in the meantime, <laughs> it's time to have a five minute of five minute, um, was it break? Okay. You might be able to just, um, uh, I'm not sure what's happened. You might have hid self view. If you go onto the three little dots at the top of your screen, you might be able to resume self view. <laughs> you don't really want to get self view again though. <laughs> Oh, that's a nice time. It's 45 minutes since we started. So let's have a break for five minutes and then I'll come back on again and we can um, do a meditation. Is that okay? Okay, so break time. I'm going to go back on again. Yeah, there we go. Still there. Hi. You never left. Okay. I thought <laughs> I was in permanent. <laughs> yeah, I thought you had no self view for a moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So there we go. That's the talk. So have a break, everybody, and three or four minutes, we can start the meditation. Is that okay? Yeah. Very good. I don't know if that was a reasonable talk. I just started and saw where, where I went to. Hope it's nice. Very lovely. Um, you know that you can hide yourself if you wish, Ajahn, if you wish to have uh, five minutes. Okay, I'm going to go to my cave and hide myself in my real home. No, no, I'm here. I, it's okay. I feel good. Whew. I will mute myself for five.
Yay. Thank you, host. <laughs> okay, I've been unmuted, which is good. I don't know about you, but sometimes some monks in my monastery speak too much. I'd love to have that mute button so I can also <laughs> mute them externally. <laughs> you may have kids in your house who speak too much and just mute. <laughs> anyway. That's one of the reasons why that somebody told me a long time ago, I don't believe in free speech. I think speech should be taxed. And people who speak too much have to pay more tax, which is probably politicians. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, uh, if you're all ready, we can actually start a meditation. Oh, yeah, for uh, just over 35 minutes instead of 37 minutes or something around that. I was supposed to do a long one. And this time that I've been suggested to me that I don't speak so much. So I'll lead you for the first 15 minutes or so, and then I'll just let you go. Yeah, probably all of you are experienced enough to know once you're peaceful what to do next, which is absolutely nothing. Just be there and enjoy every moment of it. So I often used to stay when I would travel to places like London or San Francisco or Toronto or Singapore. I've been to so many cities, very, very, very rarely in places like San Francisco or London, you very rarely you see a human being. You see human goings always going somewhere. A human being is someone who's staying here, not going anywhere, not doing anything, just being. So see if you can return to the state of just being a human being, being here. And you start by being here with your body. Quite honestly, that Sometimes people get sick because they're not with their body. They hardly visit their body. They exploit their body, they tell their body what to do. But many times they're just thinking all the time or looking outside, never really coming in that sense home inside your body. It's a much deeper home, but that's a good place to start. Your body. How is your body? Just like your home, your house. You know, sometimes you look at it and it's really untidy, it needs a, a clean up, things falling apart <laughs> in your body. But that's not the real home, the real home is inside. So just tidy up your body as best you can. Tidy it up by how your legs. Now, I'm a culprit here because I now look at my legs and see that they're really in an uncomfortable position. If I don't change them now, they'd be very uncomfortable later on during the meditation. So out of kindness, out of good sense, I'm going to just, just tidy up my legs in my home. Make them comfy. Wow, so much better. Once my legs are reasonably comfy, my butt, things are feeling good. But this part of the meditation, please don't rush it. Sometimes you miss things which cause you problems afterwards. Just like I said yesterday when you're parking your car. You gotta make sure it's all locked. The window is a little bit open. You forgot to lock it properly. And someone can get in there with the, the old coat hanger and, and undo the lock. And steal your car. So 
So just make sure your legs are really comfortable, your butt is comfortable, and your back. Here I go again. I love stretching my body at the beginning of a meditation. <clears throat> Feels great. And to care for my body, I don't tell it what to do. I ask it what it wants. Back, how are you? Are you comfortable like this? That kindness, treating all these so-called parts of you as if they're separate entities, being kind to every one of them, kind to my shoulders. Hey, shoulders, how are you? And whatever they need to do to relax to the max, that phrase, relax to the max, can be very profound. It's not a joke. It's just a saying. When you do relax your body, you know how to relax it. And the key to relaxation of the body is the mindfulness together with the kindness, the kindfulness. So really relaxing my body, relaxing my shoulders, my arms. Now I can focus on my hands, how the, especially how the fingers, they're now sort of interlocked. They're actually very comfortable. They did that by themselves. I wasn't paying attention. It's not much. But now I am. And they feel wonderful. Go back up to my shoulders and my neck. It's been a warm day today here in Australia, in West Australia. So I do have a little bit of a, an irritation in the throat, hay fever. Hay fever season. Must be a, a high pollen count this afternoon. But it's okay. And then to my face. Relaxing everything there. Every muscle, I can feel it. Relax it. First of all, I've got to be with it first. Not going somewhere, but being. Experience what it's like in my face when I'm just here, being here. Not going anywhere, not trying to get someplace, but just being here. And that itself relaxes the muscles. And then here I go again, feeling the whole body. It's already, ooh, very delightfully relaxed. I can feel the sensation of delight, which is quite strong this afternoon inside of me, surprisingly. That is surprising. <laughs> when I started to talk, I had a tummy ache. I don't know where that's gone, but it's not there anymore. Whole body at ease. It does feel like a lake without any waves on it. It's peaceful, still, joyful. Relax to the max. Once your car, your vehicle, what you use to go through life, this life, once that is all safe, secure, locked, now you can walk away from it and go inside your real home, your emotional world inside. How do you feel right now? What emotion is prominent? There's usually many emotions around the mind. What is the one which stands out more than most right now? 
It's a negative emotion. Don't cultivate it. Just know it. Don't try and get rid of it. Otherwise, you're acting like those guards in the Empress's Palace. Get out of here, monster emotion. You don't belong. So be kind. So you're reacting to a negative emotion with a kind one. A gentle one. A peaceful one. <coughs> You get to know your emotional world. And especially see if you can notice the emotion that is peace. You're so close to the emotion which is love and kindness. My father said to open the door of your heart no matter what you're experiencing. It's an act of unconditional love. It's the unconditional part of it. Makes it very peaceful. There's nothing you need to do. And the love, the kindness is the, the joy, the shine, which is on peace. So kindness and peace, almost like best friends. Growing together inside of you. And it's not kindness directed anywhere. It's just a thing in itself. Kindness. Peace. How does that feel? What is it? Try not to describe it with words. Feel it. Beautiful kindness. Because this kindness, more than anything else, makes you feel safe. You know this goodwill inside of you and around you. That goodwill, that kindness, that love, that reassurance. Kindness doesn't criticize. Kindness never puts things down or puts people down with ill will. Kindness accepts. Kindness is huge, accepts anything, it softens it, relieves the tightness and the tension, trying to be someone, somewhere, something we are not. Just are, and are, is good enough. This moment is good enough. This moment is good enough. Good enough. You don't need to add or subtract what you're experiencing now. It's good enough. When with our loving kindness and peace, you feel the emotion of good enough. The peace and the kindness go deeper. Go really deep. It's inside of you. You are entering your real home. Your inner refuge place where you can relax so much that healing, peace, insight all grow. This is your place. For those of you who want to join in, I'm going to introduce what I call the kids' meditation. Because I first taught this to kids and the parents heard it and they said, we want this too. It's Singapore. Imagine. Imagine you are sitting with your eyes closed in your room. 
Imagine, what do you imagination? Floating out of your body, floating through the roof of your apartment or home. Beautiful blue sky above, traveling, traveling over the land, over a beach, out into a warm ocean. Maybe in the Mediterranean, if you're in Australia, in, in Europe, maybe even further, the Caribbean, into your own little private island. And you land there in the sand, softly, this is your place. No one else is allowed here, only you. You're sitting in the shade of a beautiful coconut tree. And you look out over the waters of the ocean. Can't see any, any boat, big or small. There's no big waves. It's a calm day. Slight wind is blowing just to keep you cool. And feel the breeze. The breeze is like fragrant, like it's blowing over some flowers from somewhere. Some very fragrant essence is coming with the breeze, delighting you. You're sitting there, in your meditation posture, perfectly comfortable. You look at the waves, the waves are almost non existent. The whole ocean is perfectly still and warm and comfortable. Look up in the sky, only a few little cotton wool clouds, they drift so peacefully, so peacefully over the ocean. It's a place where you can relax, be free, where you have nothing to do. Nowhere to go or get to, nothing to achieve. This is your home, deep inside, a nice little ocean refuge. If you imagine, that imagination can be so refreshing. I said I wanted to be quiet for most of this meditation, so I'm going to be quiet now. You can carry on whichever way you want to go. Now start speaking again five minutes before the end of the meditation.
is getting close to the end of the meditation period. You experimented with going to your personal private little island in the ocean. Now's the time to get ready to come back. Rising slowly, traveling over the ocean, over the beach side, over the little towns and cities. See the roof of your house or apartment coming through. Now you're sitting back on your seat inside, rested. Now slowly open your eyes. I did used to teach that meditation to the youth group when I first came to Perth, every week. Now they're all to their own children. They teach the same to their kids. And they told me how effective it was. I taught that to some kids in Singapore. And their parents joined in, said, wonderful. Please teach more of this using your imagination, feeling a place of safety and rest. Just yours. You can go any time for as long as you like. <sighs> okay. I don't know about you, but I enjoyed that. <laughs> I enjoy doing this. Oh, that's nice. Mm. So, it's now the time for many of you to eat. As for me, I'm going to get a nice cup of tea. And I'll see you again in a couple of hours, in 8 o'clock. Okay, so bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so I'll log out now. Very good. We're going to leave.